Region Water Networks Speed Networking Webinar Series. We are, we are grateful that you all are with us today. I know uh, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, one of those things is, is taking care of our water, but there are many, many other things I know that are calling for your attention. So we hope you are all uh, staying safe and healthy out there. My name is Rebecca Power. I'm joining you from the University of Wisconsin, and I will be your moderator. Uh, since some of you may be new to the North Central Region Water Network, although I know um, some of you have also been with us on these webinars before, we are an extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities and our partners in 12 upper Midwestern states. This webinar was originally scheduled to take place on June 10th uh, in support of our colleagues of color in academia and in association with the Shutdown STEM and Shutdown Academia campaign, we did postpone this webinar uh, till today. And I appreciate uh, your patience as we rescheduled and uh, certainly our presenters for working with us to make sure we had uh, that time to reflect um, and to think about uh, what we can do in water resources and in academia to uh, confront systemic racism in, in our work and our lives. Um, so, but we are glad to still be able to bring you this information today. Um, uh, we want everyone in the North Central region and around the world to be able to enjoy uh, water resources in a, in a recreational and life-giving way. Um, Aquatic, the role of aquatic invasive species uh, can sometimes be overlooked in the relationship between uh, water quality, uh, what we're seeing in water quality. So uh, that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. Uh, you can see some instructions here in this first slide. Uh, please submit your questions for our presenters in the chat box. That chat box is accessible in the, uh, the purple, uh, uh, tab through the purple tab in the lower right hand corner of your webinar screen. There will be a dedicated Q&A session following our two presenters. So we'll have two presenters uh, for a little bit over 15 minutes each and then we'll have uh, most of the rest of the time for Q&A. So we'll hold your questions um, uh, until the end. A phone-in option can be accessed by opening up the session menu in the upper left area of your webinar screen and selecting use your phone for audio. The session is recorded and uh, will be available at northcentralwater.org uh, and learn at eextension.org. And you can uh, follow along with us on Twitter to um, if you want to share anything that you're learning uh, through this webinar. So uh, today's presenters, uh, the, the title of their presentation, which is a, a joint presentation, um, is Recreational Water Quality and Aquatic Invasive Species, Context and Resources for Stakeholders. So both Eugene Bragg, who is the Program Director of, uh, for Aquatic Ecosystems at The Ohio State University, and Sarah Orlando, uh, a Korean Program Manager at Ohio Sea Grant, will be our presenters. And here, here is the man himself, Eugene Bragg. So I won't read through his entire bio for you, but you can take a look at it. Uh, he brings a lot of experience and fully embraces his nerd status, um, in addition to being a classical musician and artistic director of a small concert series. So uh, lots of great experience that Eugene brings to us. And with that, I will turn it over to Eugene. Um, and boy, I've been doing a lot of presenting from the hinterland between my kitchen and living room recently, but I'm still not quite used to the sensation. It's still a very strange sensation, so bear with me. Um, there's also, uh, it's hard for me to know what to select for a presentation like this because the audience is so diverse. So in general, I am going to um, focus upon a general overview and some resources that I find available and perhaps you will as well. So a quick outline you'll see we'll start by just giving a brief background especially on invasive species themselves and the nature of water as used for recreation. Uh, let's first talk about the value of freshwater fishing. So it's periodically 
surveyed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And you can see here that in 2016, 30.1 million Americans fished 383 million days and took 322 million trips. And that, ex that amounted to an expenditure for trips and equipment of nearly $30 billion. Uh, also, there is a consulting firm that did a pretty substantial study was published in 2007 that estimated the total economic impact of Great Lakes fishing through, fishing through travel, through hotel rooms, buying gasoline, visiting restaurants on site, generated about $7.1 billion annually for the, the U.S. economy. So water quality that supports things like recreational activities like fishing obviously has a tremendous value to the North American economy. The Clean Water Act, of course, passed initially in 1972, stated an objective to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. It goes on to, determine the term, to define the term pollutant, which means dredge, spoil, solid waste, et cetera, et cetera, but included in the definition of pollutant is biological materials. And this kind of opened the door for considering aquatic invasive species as biological pollution. Uh, that concept was there from the beginning, but it really earned some momentum uh, in the late 80s after zebra and quagga mussels invaded the Great Lakes. Then we, we begin to encounter this term uh, aquatic invasive species as specifically biological pollution more and more after that time. Now definitions of invasive species vary pretty substantially. Uh, when I use the term invasive species, I'm being pretty specific in referring to a legal definition created by an executive order. That definition is a non-native organism whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal, or plant health. Right? So there are a couple of uh, aspects of that definition I want to point out. There are two things that are really, really required here. That is, before I will call a thing invasive, it has to be non-native. Right? So it comes to my place from someplace else, and it has to do something that humans would perceive as harmful. It has to do some kind of damage to some kind of human value system. It needs those two things before I'm going to consider a species invasive, non-native, and will do or has the potential to do harm to something people value. Now, obviously, perhaps only a small proportion of non-native species um, in the aquatic environment come to be considered invasive. So, for example, stock salmon or steelhead in the Great Lakes region, not many people are going to call those invasive in comparison to around goby, which does obvious harm to, for example, native sport fisheries like smallmouth bass fishery. But definitions can vary, of course, and there are a lot of ecological definitions that do vary. So some people will only consider species on the increase to be invasive. Some people will apply the term to even native organisms that are doing some kind of harm because of explosive population, etc. When I say invasive species, I'm being very deliberate in talking about a na non-native organism that is likely to be harmful to a human system. By way of example of this small proportion, here is an example from the Great Lakes, which of course is comfortably contained within the north central region. Uh, and you can see that of the almost 200 species that have been non-native species that have been documented on the Great Lakes, about a third of those have been considered to be invasive species. And of course, they have the potential to do harm. That's why we call them invasive. So by way of example, economically, the, the, the liability of invasive species has been estimated for the Great Lakes by, again, a consulting firm, the Anderson Economic Group, published in 2012. And they estimated that the damage done by invasive species to the region through harm to, for example, the fishery, uh, through the expense of cleaning mussels out of water intakes, etc., they estimated in 2012 that invasive species caused about $100 million liability annually to the Great Lakes region. That's just the U.S. portion of the Great Lakes region, of course. Uh, regarding environmental, I often think in terms of energy. 
So um, energy that's contained by biological systems. So when I think, for example, of predation, I think of an invasive species that preys upon natives as taking energy away from uh, native systems. In competition, they're preventing energy from getting to those native systems. They can also disrupt habitat functions. So if you take, for example, a smooth uh, mud substrate where certain organisms uh, use as habitat, and you cover that with the hard shell of zebra or quagga mussels, you very substantially change the way that habitat works. If the organisms are closely enough related to some of our natives, they can cause genetic disruption. On some occasions, they can serve as a food source for native species. And for example, that was probably one of the greatest impacts on the recovery of the great of the Lake Erie water snake was the fact that the Lake Erie water snakes diet is so now dominated by round goby, an invasive species that's rather easy to catch. Uh, that easily available food source led pretty directly to the recovery of the Lake Erie water snake. But that often comes with uh, byproducts that we don't like. So for example, trophic cascade effects, uh, also introducing the round goby, mobilized historic contaminants through a food web created by zebra mussel to round goby to smallmouth bass, by which PCBs, these uh, rather nasty persistent uh, toxins that were falling out of availability in the environment for a number of decades, creating that new food chain, that new thread of the food web uh, through zebra mussels to round goby to smallmouth bass, PCB concentrations in smallmouth bass on Lake Erie tripled after the introduction of that new thread of the food web. And the big game changer really is shifting bioenergetic flow. So I think of, for example, here's the classic food pyramid. You have all of the energy, all the living energy on earth driven by the sun. Green things like phytoplankton and aquatic systems turn that energy into living things. The little bugs eat the, the little plants. The little fish eat the little bugs. The bigger fish eat the, uh, eat the little fish, uh, on and on all the way up, right? So we've got this thriving food pyramid. If you put something like a big predatory animal, like a snakehead, the snakehead operates near the top of that food pyramid. It can have an effect on the system, but mostly it's directly interacting with those things that are near to it on the food pyramid. So, for example, the fish that it eats, it might suppress that population. But if you put something that effectively operates near the bottom of the system, like a zebra mussel, that can remove a whole lot of phytoplankton from the system, it changes the nature of how energy flows up the entirety of that system. So hopefully I've made at least some case that aquatic invasive species has the potential to become biological pollution. Here are a couple organisms. I'm not going to dwell in great length upon these, but some organisms that have my recent concern. Grass carp, right? In 2012, there were some juvenile grass carp collected on the Sandusky River in Ohio. They evidently came from the 2011 year class. I uh, remembering 2011, it was a really prolonged spring, lots of water, high water very late into the year compared to what's typical. I thought I might not see another year like that for 20 or 40 years, right? And if they're spawning every 20 to 40 years, is that a concern? Well, it happened again in 2015, 17, 18, and 19. Uh, now, almost all of these were collections of fertilized eggs. There is only one year in which actual larval fish were collected, uh, and it's a pretty long haul for a fertilized egg to become a, a population in a body of water like Lake Erie. But um, if they are doing this year after year, there is at least that potential. Red swamp crayfish are recently expanding. They are up from Louisiana, uh, popular food fish, but also popular in aquaria in classrooms and released to the wild, they displace native crayfish. A couple aquatic plants are recently on the move that I've got my eye on. Hydrilla, 
most commonly referred to by its genus, simply Hydrilla, but its common name is water thyme. Uh, it recently invaded in the Great Lakes region, but it's been invading in the south for a number of years. It's really problematic in that it forms these really dense monotypic stands and impedes, for example, recreational boating. Yellow floating heart was introduced as an ornamental. It seemed to be kind of stagnating for a while, but recently more and more populations are cropping up in the region in Ohio. And European frog bit is one that I knew was coming, but it uh, came in such a big way that it surprised me. So, for example, 2017, we had the first um, officially reported population of European frog bit in Ohio. By 2019, out on McGee Marsh, which is one of the most important birding areas actually in the entirety of the world, European frog bit looked like this in just two years. So, a handful of organisms to keep your eye on if you're interested in managing aquatic invasive species. Let's talk a little bit about the policy setting, but only a little bit because there's not much more boring than talking about law. So um, the one I'm really, well, I'm not going to, to dwell much on this slide at all. I will point out that one of the primary tools for managing against invasive species, especially invasive animals, was the Lacey Act, which is administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the Lacey Act has the potential to list animals as uh, wildlife as injurious. Historically, that meant uh, that if an animal was listed as injurious, it could not be transported across state lines. However, that restriction was challenged by some reptile keeper, peak keeping associations, and in 2017, the rule was finalized and affirmed. So that no longer holds. The Lacey Act thus has a pretty big chink in its armor. However, Lacey Act violations can be invoked if a state takes it upon them to create a blacklist. So if you transport an organism that a state has blacklisted that's also listed as injurious by the Lacey Act, that can invoke federal issues. Uh, you can look up these other uh, legal documents if you care to. I'm not going to dwell on them. I am going to talk, though, a little bit about the National Invasive Species Act. Uh, that created the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force because it has some direct implication for the states where you work. So the Invasive Species Act created the National Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force to develop programs to prevent introduction and dispersal of invasive species, to monitor, control, and study, to conduct research, to coordinate programming and activities across jurisdictions and between agencies, and to educate and inform the general public and policymakers. And this task force is advised by and sends funding to states through six regional panels. Uh, I represent Ohio on the Mississippi River Basin panel. If you're interested in becoming involved, uh, I really encourage you to become involved because, again, there is a mechanism to move money to your states for invasive species programming through these task force. Uh, these task force panels, and these are of the six panels that advise the task force, the North Central region intersects these three, the Mississippi River Basin panel, the Great Lakes panel, and the Western panel. So check out those links, uh, look them up later as you can review these slides. We'll move on because 15 minutes is a tight timeline. Regarding state regulatory authority, that largely falls to state agencies and almost always it's going to be those agencies that are charged with management or regulation of natural resources, especially of harvesting wildlife. So for example, in Ohio, regulatory authority almost entirely falls to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. And they maintain an aquatic invasive species management plan and in maintaining that plan, that qualifies them for some federal funding through the Invasive Species Act and the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. Within Ohio, I also chair a committee to advise state policy on aquatic invasive species issues. Um, and most states will probably have a similar committee, but not necessarily. This committee has the advantage of being rather informal, right? So it's not one where we have to uh, have our membership approved by the governor's office. We informally collect those entities, uh, individuals, um, organizations who 
have some background knowledge, who are our stakeholders, have some interest in the game of managing invasive species, and we use their advice to inform policy of the state. Our mission statement is to provide a forum for Ohio's diverse stakeholders, its resource management agencies, and related industries and organizations to advise the state about the prevention and control of aquatic invasive species, and for the state to inform those stakeholders about developing issues and policy. So kind of a two-way communication, uh, both from stakeholders to the state and vice versa. Uh, as I crafted this initial uh, mission statement, it was much simpler, but uh, the uh, this was uh, a mission statement developed by committee and it became increasingly large and cumbersome. There is a link to our page. You can find all the presentations of the last several years that have been given in our meetings. Check it out, ask questions if you want to emulate something like this where you happen to live. Now, uh, I'm just going to dwell a little bit to close on some specific resources that are useful in dealing with aquatic invasive species. Before I launch into this, though, uh, while I'm thinking of it, I want to point out that a couple that I forgot to include in the slides by the time I emailed them yesterday were NASMA, the National Aquatic Invasive, I'm sorry, the North American Invasive Species Management Association, North American Invasive Species Management Association. Their website is naisma.org. So check them out. Uh, they are professionals who are charged with managing invasive species. They have a great conference every year. Uh, also within our region, there is the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference. And that's something I also recommend you check out. That is at umisc, umisc.net, Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference. Uh, and that is a conference that's held every other year. This year I happen to be on the committee that is putting together aquatic programming. And we, because of coronavirus issues, we are taking that conference to an online only um, format this fall. So check out umisc.net. Uh, attending is a lot easier online and a lot cheaper. Mostly I'm going to talk about databases that I make frequent use of in thinking about the management of these organizations. And the biggest one is going to be the NAS database, the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database managed by the U.S. Geological Survey. This is really the U.S.'s best repository for information on aquatic invasive species. It updates uh, range maps and fact sheets uh, with great frequency. Regarding reports and range maps, though, it really depends upon user reports to update its data. So do submit your reports. There is an easy mechanism for submitting reports. I do so very often. And this is the database that is, seems to me, it finds the greatest use among professional agencies who manage against invasive species. Related is GLANSYS, the Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System. This is largely a search engine that interfaces with the USGS NAS database, but it's Great Lakes specific, and you can narrow your searches by uh, lakes specifically, or the lakes and their entire watershed, by different groups of organisms, so for example, fish or plants, etc. Uh, very useful, very flexible search engine that is used regionally to interface with the, the uh, NAS database of the U.S. Geological Survey. EDMAPS, the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, was developed by the University of Georgia, but it tends to be used and promoted by academics. So agency folks tend to use the USGS database, Academic seems to me to use EDMAPS. Um, again, this depends upon input, especially by citizen scientists, and especially interacting through uh, regional apps that have been developed for smartphones. So, for example, in my region, we have the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. You download that app to your phone, you go out to the field, you see something, you take a picture of an invasive species, the phone tags it with a, uh, a latitude and longitude. Uh, and a report goes to EDMAPS. Before the report is posted to EDMAPS, though, professional uh, administrators of the database have to confirm the identification. And that is my job for any of the aquatic organisms that are reported to EDMAPS using Gleddon, the Gleddon app within Ohio. So look at EDMAPS, look for regional apps that uh, interface with EDMAPS, and 
spread the word among your clientele. Also, you may find uh, print information resources, so locally specific field guides were available. And I've, I've put this up. Uh, this is Ohio's, and I'm a co-editor of this. I mostly put it up because I'm a co-editor of this. And I'm going to talk about a couple outreach campaigns. I'm going to give Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers a very short shrift because Sarah is going to expand upon them much more substantially. So I instead will give you a little bit more on the Habitatitude campaign. The Habitatitude campaign was developed as a partnership among federal government uh, entities, especially the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, and industry players uh, and academics. The industry players mostly being pet aquarium and uh, nursery industries. And in essence, they, they strive to develop a coordinated message to try to get people who keep organisms in trade to be better stewards of those organisms in trade. Minimize the escapes to the wild to get them to take care of their water gardens and aquarium animals without releasing to the wild. And I ordinarily take questions at this point, but Sarah will speak be, before I take questions. However, I didn't want to waste an opportunity to admire pictures of myself with fish. So here are pictures of myself with fish. And this is where you can find me. And I'm going to turn the mic over now to the uh, moderators and to Sarah. Great, Eugene. Thank you so much. Um, and we've got questions stocking up in the chat box for you. So we're looking forward to getting to those after we hear from Sarah. So Sarah Orlando is our speaker. Uh, Sarah is the program manager for the Ohio Clean Marinas program, as we mentioned in the beginning. And I'll just let you glance through her bio there and um, get, to, get to her content. So welcome, Sarah, and thanks so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. So before you unmute, if you don't mind, Rebecca, let me know if you can hear me okay. <laughs> yes, we can hear you great. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so similar to Eugene, I wanted to thank you all for being here today and um, for adapting, um, making yourselves available this afternoon so that we had time last Wednesday to reflect on the current situation. Thank you, folks. I just know uh, volume is low. I'll try and Let's get that up right. Um, so I'm going to do what's called the part two of the recreational water quality and invasive species presentation here. Um, Eugene covered excellently the overview of aquatic invasive species and really uh, kind of the background of some of the efforts that are going on in the Great Lakes and in the north central region. Um, what I am going to cover here is delving a little bit further into specifically uh, recreational boating and uh, what some of the initiatives that we have in Ohio related to invasive species prevention and recreational boating and hoping to share some lessons learned or some information that you all can take with you in your respective states and then also as Eugene mentioned expanding on the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign and sharing some educational resources as well as an upcoming event um, that may be of interest to some of you. So, points here. Well, we'll first do is start with um, some information about the Clean Marinas program. Um, so, in my role with Ohio Sea Grant, I manage a statewide uh, voluntary certification program for marinas. Um, in this sector, basically, I specialize in recreational boating, and we use this voluntary certification program to really help engage marinas in protecting the very resource that they need for their livelihood. Um, the way we explain this program is basically saying, you know, you need clean water to, to, to have a marina, right? Um, people don't want to go boating on, um, you know, in a recreational water body, body that's impaired for water quality um, that may be shut down, for example, um, due to aquatic invasive species and boat motors not able to go through that water or um, any other reason uh, that may be related to water quality. Um, so we kind of use that approach and engage marinas and taking, in a lot of cases, simple steps or slightly changing their practices um, 
so that they can have a improved impact on water quality in their region um, and in their local facility. Um, but also the way that I explain it is uh, marinas are essentially the last chance that, that any action can be done in a nearshore environment before runoff and, and water uh, reaches that body of water. Um, so we, we, we interact with them in that um, aspect as well. Um, for Ohio, we have about 500 marinas, give or take, uh, including the mall and top marinas in the state of Ohio. And uh, across the entire state, we are a, a statewide initiative. So we work with both Lake Erie watershed marinas and uh, inland marinas and Ohio River, water, Ohio River watershed marinas. And uh, we cover close to 4,000 square miles of water, including Lake Erie shoreline. I want to mention for those of you, which there are many, who are not from Ohio, um, the Clean Marinas Initiative is a national initiative. Um, so every state in the Great Lakes has a Clean Marina, either formal certification program or an educational initiative, um, whether it's a, you know environmental best practices that they have available for their marine owners. And then also um, there's a group that is called the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network. And I'm gonna see if I can share this link here. And as part of that group, they, uh, we all created a uh, Great Lakes Clean Marina Best Management Practices Guide. Even though it's called the Great Lakes Clean Marina BMP Guide, the whole purpose of this guide, it is, it is for any marina. So any marina across the country, whether or not they have a program available to them to actually become certified as a clean marina, we encourage them to take a look at this guide. It has entire sections on invasive species, stormwater, other uh, topics related to water quality. And um, they're great best practices that a marina should be doing or should be considering if they are mindful of their water quality. Um, so that's just a great guide if you are in a state that does not have a clean marina certification program. What um, our program has been around since about 2004, 2005. And in 2006, uh, what we realized is, well, we have you know hundreds of marinas across Ohio, um, but we have hundreds of thousands of recreational boaters, right? And so a program was started uh, as kind of a sister program called the Ohio Clean Boater Program. And this is much less rigorous than the Clean Marinas Program, um, but essentially the same core foundation. It's a voluntary program to engage boaters in keeping our waterways clean. Um, this is the primary mechanism that I provide education and outreach to the recreational boating public on aquatic invasive species. So the way that we administer this program is we go to uh, recreational boating events, boat shows, um, yeah, like I go to marina open houses, any kind of public event where a boater may be, um, even kind of paddling events or, or um, learn to boat events that are going on. And we may set up a table. I actually have, as I think Eugene may have as well, a portable um, mock Asian carp that I will bring with me and put up on the table um, as an attention grabber to talk to people about aquatic invasive species, their impact on invas invasive, or excuse me, their impact on boating, and how boaters can become engaged in helping to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, so what we do is we, at these outreach events, engage with the boaters, talk to them, and then we have a, a we try and find a way to connect with them and have more of a long-term connection with them and impact. So we have um, something called the Clean Boater Pledge that I'll share next in the chat box here. And that is simply a little bit more, it's certainly, again, not as um, strict or uh, formal as our Clean Marina certification, but it is a online pledge that the boater can fill out and it basically enables them to check off boxes saying, you know, okay, one, you know, I became educated on water quality and how I can help with water quality, but I'm gonna actually pledge to take steps um, to help protect that water quality. Um, so if you follow the link or if you look, check that out later, um, one of our checklist items is that the boaters pledge 
to prevent the spread of, of aquatic invasive species uh, by following clean drain dry procedures, which I'll go into more in a minute. Um, and what we do is we, we collect those sludges. Um, you know, we're with Ohio State. We don't uh, do anything with them. We simply or sell them or anything like that. We, we have a newsletter. So we have a clean boner e-newsletter uh, that then allows us to follow up uh, with these uh, boaters. Uh, we can follow up and say, hey, you know, you pledged to take steps to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Have you actually done that? Or here's a friendly reminder, you know, before spring is starting, please make sure that you are um, taking steps to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species or other water quality issues. Um, so it's a great way that when we may only have one point of contact with one person or one boater at a state fair or a boat show, um, it's a way we can continue with, to engage with that audience moving forward. Um, so I encourage you if, you, if you have a clean marinas program or if you have a clean boating initiative or something in your state, um, feel free to um, you know, take this information, share it, use it as an example. Um, we found that it's a way that we can stay in touch with our boaters. Um, even though we may only see them once. Um, also, if you'd like to sign up for our Clean Boner newsletter, please feel free to fill that out. I'll say it's not exclusive to Ohioans. Um, we will share as part of that newsletter relevant water quality information, science-based information from Sea Grant, um, fun videos and updates that we do on clean boating um, when we send out those e-newsletters. All right. And so where this all ties into invasive species is um, when I started, uh, a lot of the education that I was providing through these programs um, was, was based in non-point source pollution. And we were talking about stormwater and wastewater and fueling and, and other sources of pollution uh, in the recreational boating sector. Um, aquatic invasive species certainly has been a part of the conversation, but I will say in um, my career with Sea Grant, uh, this topic has certainly evolved as one of the top uh, concerns of the boating public, um, one of the top, I would say, economic impacts and, and, and um, truly impactful issues um, for recreational water users. Um, so here's a slide, and this is a, a national survey that goes out. Uh, the annual economic impact of recreational boating is on a level of $170 billion across the United States. Um, aquatic invasive species affect boating in many ways. Uh, it can affect literally physically <laughs> boating um, on a water body. Uh, there are examples of aquatic invasive species shutting down entire lakes in some states uh, to recreational boating due to, uh, for example, aquatic plants uh, clogging the lake so bad that you can't get a boat motor uh, through that water. As you can see in the bottom left photo, paddling or just hand-powered uh, watercraft can certainly become difficult in areas where you may have uh, significant aquatic invasive species um, spread in that area. It can affect the equipment and infrastructure related to recreational boating. Anything from boat motors uh, that, you know, many places, if you drive anywhere across the north central region, you'll probably find a marina with boats in the water. Uh, if boats are there in a long period of time and you have a zebra mussel or a quagga mussel infested lake or water body, uh, chances are you'll have some zebra mussels and quagga mussels grow on, on the bottom of your boat and on the motor and all sorts of uh, equipment over time. And that takes time and money to remove. And a lot, a big factor in recreational boating is, is efficiency, the ability, the ability to move through the water um, and I have a streamlined vessel. And so a lot of boaters spend lots of money every year uh, power washing the bottoms of the boats, cleaning off fouling organisms, including invasive species that, that accumulate on the bottoms of those vessels. Of note, marina infrastructure is also a significant expense um, that marine owners have to, to pay and, and keep their infrastructure up to date and um, maintain it. And uh, aquatic invasive species certainly affect that as well. Finally, a couple other impacts. Um, I will say this isn't so much the case in Ohio. Um, we do not have a uh, regulatory mechanism for requiring uh, 
boaters coming from body of water to body of water to actually clean and um, either decontaminate or, or clean their vessels before going to a new body of water. But certainly in some states, um, that, that can add up to just the ability to get out on the water, uh, people waiting in line um, to have their boat inspected if they are coming from either out of state or another body of water um, before they enter that, that new body of water. And then the other one is impacts to water quality and recreation. Um, anything from water clarity that is affected by zebra mussels and aquaga mussels. Uh, a lot of the boaters I talk to in Ohio say, well, I like clean water, right? It's what we want. Um, well, we are not really meant to have you know, crystal clear Caribbean water in the Great Lakes. And so um, that water clarity causes ecosystem changes, uh, one of which being the vegetation on the bottom growing up to the top because the sunlight makes it deeper in the water column. And so that can cause impacts to recreational boating because again, you can't get a boat motor through the water. Um, so water quality and, and to go back to Eugene's point about uh, concerns with grass carp and then ultimately, uh, the potential for introduction of Asian carp. Um, one of the main objectives of recreational boating and, and, and many recreational activities is, is getting away, right? The ability to relax and enjoy a day in the water. Um, well, having Asian carp, that, that the silver carp in particular, that um, may impact how you are boating, um, you know, being able to go through the water without having a fish jump in your boat, um, that, that experience of recreational boating is affected by aquatic invasive species. So one of the campaigns that Eugene mentioned that I'm going to go into a little bit more is the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. Um, I highly recommend, and I'm gonna share the website here, that this is something you bookmark. And if you are interested in this topic, this is something that you follow up on and learn more about after this webinar. Um, this is a great, a uh, campaign that's a national campaign with the goal of conveying a consistent message for recreational water users on, on um, invasive species. So I'm gonna go over a couple things here. On the website, just a note to follow up with, there's an overview of aquatic invasive species that are so, they're associated with what recreational water use. Um, so if you're looking on finding out more information about those invasives, there's, um, you can actually purchase outreach products that you could have in an event when talking about aquatic invasive species. There's partnership opportunities. You can sign up to be a partner with this campaign. There's an outline of preventative actions for recreational water users that I'll go into more in a second. And then there's ways to get involved on a whole variety of levels. So some of the examples of when we talk about, all right, well, you know, how do recreational water users, how can they spread aquatic invasive species? This is just a short list of the types of equipment and, and um, infrastructure that could be affected where invasive species could either get caught up or attached to over time and absolutely potentially spread from one body of water to one body of water. Um, so I'll leave that there for you to review. Um, but at the top, what I want to note is, again, if you go to the website and uh, go through to find the prevention, the preventative action section, uh, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers has done a really good job. They break it down by different groups. They'll have uh, hand-powered watercraft. So, you know, your, your kayaks and canoes, they'll have uh, powered, you know, watercraft. So your power boats, your sail sailboats, they'll have scuba divers. Um, they have beachgoers, any type of recreational water user, they have adapted the guidelines for that specific user audience. So if you work with any one of those types of recreational water users, I encourage you to check out this website, find the preventative actions, and then just incorporate that into your education to that user group um, as part of your, you know, your work or however you partner with others. I'm gonna list a couple of the overarching best practices. These generally apply to power boating, but they're very much adaptable to the different types of recreational water uses. And the way that a lot of these are approached is, you know, something is better than nothing. So at the very least, you know, let's do something to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And then if you can go up to the highest level, great, that's great, but let's, let's try something, um, you know, rather than nothing. So a good scenario is, 
Um, it, the way that some of the practices go it is basically inspect, remove, or otherwise known as clean, drain, and, and dry. Um, so you inspect all equipment for any sort of invasive species, whether it be plants, animals, what have you. Remove any vegetation, debris, or animals, and drain all water from the motor, build, what I would say is if you're talking about a kayak or canoe, flip that over, make sure you drain water or use a towel to drain out the inside. The note here about planning and recording your efforts, this is good for volunteer groups that maybe are helping at a boat ramp um, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. A great idea is to have a checklist so that you make sure you're hitting all the potential spots on a, on a boat or, a, um, or equipment to make sure you don't miss anything. The next scenario, the better scenario, is um, cold rinsing any boat, trailers, and equipment with a garden hose, and it's available using a mild bleach or salt solution on all equipment there. Then I'll go to the next best uh, option, which would be using high pressure rinse with a power washer or using it in line for a boat to a trailer. You may see this being done either um, voluntary, voluntarily a lot of groups will do this um, at fishing tournaments and things like that, or um, uh, we're starting to see at popular boat ramps where there's a station where you can actually pull off um, and, and wash down your vessel uh, before leaving that body of water, or leaving that site. And the absolute best scenario, this is again, if you have uh, limited resources and have the ability to um, access um, this type of equipment, it'd be a hot pressure rinse with pressure wash, um, pressure wash water above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, ideally in a wash line so you have an efficient system where it's kind of one boat at a time, there's a pull-off area, and where you have a hookup for water and obviously a supply for um, an electrical supply for getting the hot water and the power washer running. So that's just a basic overview there. Um, what I'm leaving you with here are some educational resources. I shared some of the key websites already in the chat box window, um, but this is also some resources that I encourage you to check out. Uh, Eugene already mentioned the AIS field guide, but if you're looking for um, an educational outreach item, uh, there's a great aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes fact sheet that's available. It's great for just providing an overview of why we should care about invasive species, um, you know, and kind of what these invasive species are and, and why we should get involved in helping to prevent their spread. Uh, the Clean Marinas program in Ohio, we put together an AIS Best Practices for Boaters YouTube video. It's meant to be a short video uh, that's easily shared on social media or, you know, what have you on, on web pages and things like that to provide the clean, drain, dry message to boaters. And then if you do have a volunteer group or if you know of anyone that's interested in starting up a, like a vessel wash down station for invasive species, the Clean Boats, Clean Tournaments group has a YouTube video that's very excellent in going over how to set up a boat wash station for a fishing tournament or some sort of large event where you'd have lots of vessels coming through. All right. With that, I'm going to leave you with a final event that's coming up. It's called the Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz. This is a collaborative, um, a collaborative outreach campaign that's happening across the Great Lakes. Um, the whole point is engaging people across multiple states, including um, all the United States and then our partners in Canada, on taking steps and educating the boating public about invasive species and preventing their spread. Um, so I'm going to list this website here as well, and I'll do that after I'm done here. Um, and you can actually go on this website, learn about the events that are happening across the Great Lakes. If you're interested in partnering on an event, this um, specific year it's happening during, during June 28th to July 10th, and you can either sign up to participate. There's a number of states, some states are doing in-person. Uh, Ohio, we're going the route of more of like a virtual event, but we're still trying to engage folks and um, helping share a conversation on invasive species prevention in the Great Lakes um, during this time frame. Um, so keep an eye out for that on social media. Feel free to follow along. There'll be a press release coming out. Um, and again, reach out to the website and the state contacts on that page if you're interested in doing something in your state um, if you're in the Great Lakes. 
All right. And I'm going to pass back off to Rebecca and see if we have questions and how we want to go about that. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and yes, we'll go right to questions. If uh, any of our, our participants on the line here have questions for you, Jean or Sarah, that you've not already put in the chat box, now is the time to do that. So uh, our first question is from Marty, and it was related to EdMaps and whether EdMaps is available in Wisconsin. Yes, EdMaps is nationwide. Uh, and frankly, if you want to interact with EdMaps using an app, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network uh, covers Wisconsin too. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Have a lot of okay. I'm just looking back at the questions here. Uh, I think that was so. I had a question, uh, Eugene, and that is. Uh, what factors are presenting, preventing grass carp from becoming a viable population in Lake Erie? So there, it's, this is a more complicated question than you might realize. There is a pretty big disconnect between a fertilized egg and an adult fish uh, in any population. So uh, it's, it's not easy to predict the number of adult fish you will get from even larval fish after hatching. Regarding grass carp in particular, they need a certain length of river. Uh, they need some turbulence in the river in order for those eggs to be suspended above the substrate. And as they are flowing, they spawn up a river. As those eggs are flowing down river, they are sinking slowly. Uh, a turbulent river will keep them buoyed up. Um, more still water will allow them to settle into the substrate where they uh, allegedly suffocate and die. So. Collecting fertilized eggs, especially in the case of grass carp, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get adult grass carp because if the river is not long enough and with enough turbulent flow to keep the eggs in suspension, if those eggs reach a lake and settle out, those eggs die. Excellent. Thank you. It sounded, um, it sounded like there's a lot of serious attempts going on there by grass carp and uh, Glad to hear more information uh, about what you know what it would take for that actually for them actually to take hold. Um, we have well, no. I, let me add that the the fact that there are uh, that there are enough adults to more and more frequently generate eggs is concerning, because eventually there will be that year that produces a year class. Yes, thank you. Right, not, not to right not to minimize the threat certainly. Um, okay, so I uh, thank you both so much. Um, Dean mentioned uh, Dean mentioned that this is a, a relatively it's a lot of information to put in a short period of time, and we deliberately uh, call these speed networking webinars. So we know we're just giving you a taste of of what Eugene and Sarah uh, have to offer, um, and if you can see their email addresses here. Feel free to contact them to follow up on any. Uh, juicy tidbits that you <laughs> learned on this uh, webinar. And um, I know they will be uh, eager to help answer your questions and get uh, get you involved in some of the initiatives that they mentioned. Uh, we do have um, a, another upcoming webinar that we wanted to let you know about. And that one uh, is related to uh, climate change and our North Central Climate Collaborative that uh, is taking place on Monday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern, and you can register at this um, this address here or look, go to the North Central Climate Collaborative website. Uh, and uh, we thank you all very much for participating today. Uh, and you can, again, go to northcentralwater.org for the archived version of this webinar. And we um, always appreciate it when you share that freely with folks that you know can benefit from the information that was presented here today. So thanks again, Eugene, and to Sarah for the great information you've provided. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.